Good evening and welcome to the New School and to this event, uh, a conversation about gun culture with Gary Young and Jelani Cobb. My name is Sean Jacobs and I'm an Associate Professor of International Affairs here at the New School and I'm here to welcome you on behalf of the Executive Dean of the Milano School, Mary Watson, who couldn't be here. My contribution will be very short. Milano and the New School is honored to present another discussion of national importance with our longtime partners, the Nation Institute, Nation Books, and the Nation Magazine. In a minute, I will hand over to Taya Kitman, Executive Director of the Nation Institute, who will inter introduce Gary and Jelani. It's especially for me an honor to welcome back Gary to the New School. Gary is a friend, and I'm particularly pleased to welcome him back here to the New School. Claudia Rankin has said, another day in the death of America should be required reading for anyone naming themselves American. The book is based on a simple but awful premise that every day, on average, seven children or teens are shot dead in the United States. Gary picked a random day, November 23rd, 2013, a day on which 10 children or teens died and brought us their stories. As he writes, like the weather that day, none of them would make big news beyond their immediate locale because like the weather, their deaths did not intrude on the accepted order of things but conform to it. By making them news, he asked us to question that order. So I want to welcome Gary and Jelani, and I want to give over to Taya. Thank you so much. Um, in preparing for this evening, it was, and reading um, this book, I urge everyone here to read it. It is so moving and memorable and shocking, and it'll stay with you, you know, forever. Um, I just wanted to briefly introduce Gary. He is an Alfred Nobler Fellow at the Nation Institute. Um, many of you know him from his award-winning columns at The Guardian and The Nation. Um, his previous books include The Speech, the story behind Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s dream, Who We Are and Should It Matter in the 21st, 21st Century, Stranger in a Strange Land, Encounters in the Disunited States, and No Place Like Home, A Black Britain's Journey Through the American South. Gary will be joined in conversation by Dr. Jelani Cobb, who is a staff writer at The New Yorker and a professor at the Columbia School of Journalism. He is the recipient of the 2015 Sidney Hillman Award for Opinion and Analysis Writing, and he writes frequently about race, politics, history, and culture. He is the author of The Substance of Hope, Barack Obama, and The Paradox of Progress, as well as To Break of Dawn, a freestyle on the hip-hop aesthetic. His articles and essays have appeared in the Washington Post, The New Republic, Essence, Vibe, The Progressive, and The Root. So what we're going to do is have a conversation between um, Gary and Jelani, and then we'll open it up to questions on note cards. And um, then briefly, uh, Gary will read from the book to close. So thank you and welcome. Uh, so Gary, um, thank you for coming. I knew you came in from Indiana uh, just today uh, for this conversation. And I thought that we would start out as we're kind of all gathered here in the uh, waning days of the Republic. Um, <laughs> we can, <laughs> history will record that you know we gathered here before it all went to hell. Um, but uh, I wondered, in reading this book, um, one, it's a difficult book to read, and which said to me that it was probably an exponentially more difficult book to write. And so I wondered, uh, what was that process like of being immersed in the grimness of what happened, and then knowing that this was just one day. Yeah, so, uh, I mean, when I started out <coughs> um, uh, with a different publisher to the one that um, I ended up with, um, we had this conversation, uh, how do we make sure that this is not a tale of just unrelenting woe, just dead child after dead child after dead child. And that <coughs> the conclusion we came to was that, that, well, it will be as much about their lives as it will about their deaths, and that the process, actually, of finding them and finding out was as, and sometimes more exacting mm. than actually the recording of it. I mean, you really had to 
some of these people did not want to be found, particularly not by me, just kind of by anybody, and that the way that America's laid out doesn't make it easy for them to find either. And so, um, that I mean, there is a grimness to it. I mean, you know, at the beginning of every chapter, it's a little bit like um, uh, Six Feet Under, if any of you saw that show, where at the beginning of every show, somebody dies. And yet, somehow, you end that show not thinking this is just a story about people dying, but people living and and so on. And so, there is that inevitable uh, grimness. But then there is just these stories of youth and childhood and Jaden at the beginning, you know, playing Glide, which is this game he's made up. He's nine years old where he jumps off a table with an umbrella. I'm a nine-year-old and, you know, one of my favorite phrases at home is, what could possibly go wrong? <laughs> you know? And so, so the life of a nine-year-old or Justin at the end who's smuggling girls into his room and the kind of you know, the um, uh, Edwin in Houston whose mum is convinced that he does not smoke weed and you go to his Facebook page and his profile picture is a big marijuana leaf and you think there were signs, you know, there were signs. And so in a range of ways, in the bringing these kids' stories to life actually is a thing that makes it not only grim, I think, or hope. And so uh, one of the things I think you started out talking about um, really trying to understand, uh, one, trying to understand the United States, mm. and then there's this particular um, aspect of American life that is inscrutable to many Americans ourselves. And so I wonder kind of what you took away from this, like what the, the learning experience was? Um, uh, well, I mean, f first of all, it was the way in which certain people, I was stunned by the way in which certain people were counted out, just counted out of everything. And I have a kind of understanding, I think, of race and class and media and so on. I'm a black journalist and I've written about things a lot, but I hadn't seen them come together in quite this way where, and this happened just just yesterday with um, uh, Trinity Day, is that her name? Trinity, the, the daughter of the Olympic sprinter who was uh, shot in a... Gay, yeah. A Trinity Gay, who was shot with... Uh, Are you all f familiar with this, the sprinter Tyson Gay? Um, so his yeah. daughter, who's 15, and somebody tweeted back at me, how much of a victim was she really? She was out at 3 o'clock in the morning. And so you have this thing where... If you're a black parent, you have to kind of make the case of why your child should not be shot. And... You want to say to this person, so what, what time of night would you consider it unreasonable to shoot a 15-year-old? 11 o'clock? 11.15? When, when do the killing fields like open? Because well, that should be public knowledge, so we all know. And so in each case, what you, or not in each case, but in many cases, you have this, these assumptions that are kind of so deep that they pose as fact, you know. Um, the one that sh struck me most was Samuel Brightman, who's um, shot one night, walking uh, his friend home, half past 11 in Dallas. And it's in Pleasant Grove, Dallas, which is a hard African-American area, and uh, hard meaning poor. And um, the second note under, the second comment under the piece says, well, parents really need to know where their children are, you know. I wouldn't let my kids out at 11.30. And you see this cogs whirring of kind of feral children, negligent parents. A whole world view is established. And then you actually find the mother, because this only got 90 words in the local paper, so nobody knows who this kid is. You find the mother, and you find that they were playing Uno, drinking cocoa, and watching We're the Millers, and then he decided to walk his friend the six minutes 
home. His friend was over because he was going to go to church with his grandmother the next morning. Samuel didn't know anybody in that area. It's not that his mother didn't know where he was. She just couldn't save him. And so there was this understanding that a lot of these kids who get killed are not just from a different area, but they're a different species, and that their parents are a different species, and that that's the kind of thing that happens over there. So that's, that's kind of one of the things that I learned that I didn't fully expect, even though I'd encountered it in a range of ways in the kind of many years, 12 years that I'd been reporting here. And the other one was the degree to which, particularly for the African-American parents, so on this day, 10 kids are shot dead, the average is seven, but on this day there are ten uh, that I found. Seven black, two Latino, one white. All of the black parents assumed that their kid might be shot. All of them. You say, did you think this can happen? And they say, yeah. I mean, Samuel's mom says, I didn't think it would be him. I thought it would be his brother. You know, um, uh, the, when... Uh, two policemen come to the door, Justin Hinnon's house, his dad Greg says, I knew either he killed somebody or more likely he'd been killed. Um, and then the father in Newark who says, you're not doing your job properly as a black father if you don't assume that your son can be shot dead. I interviewed Maya Angelou in like 2002 and didn't fully understand at the time what she said about 9-11, she said that African Americans have been living in a state of terror for several hundred years. And this to me suddenly made this very clear what that, that, that kind of thing is reserved for war zones. And that's where a lot of these people effectively live. And then there was one other thing that I learned that I was surprised by, which was that when you, I asked the open-ended question to all of the parents, what do you think this is about? You know, and I would often invoke my Englishness. I'm from England. This doesn't happen. What do you think this is about? Nobody mentions guns. When you ask a specific question, what do you think of guns, then nearly all of them are like, it's crazy, it's too many of them, so on. And I figured that it's a bit like traffic. If your kid was run over, you couldn't imagine a world without traffic. And so, and if you could, if you said, well, we're going to have a speed bump or we're going to have a stop sign, no one would say, well, that's unconstitutional. So in the absence of any discussion that they feel they could engage with, any movement that was in their kind of midst, it was just like, you know, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? These things are here. And I, you know... In no other Western country would this book be possible. It's also it's also um, telling uh, that in a particular way, like the language that we have around it, um, and the commonality, the fact that this is kind of expected um, to happen, and also the way in which um, the immediate language of well, what were they doing? What was wrong with the parents? What were they trying to find a sort of deficit in the parenting mm. um, or the community? Or I think you quoted Bill O'Reilly in there where he says, uh, uh, these people shouldn't uh, let their communities turning to shooting, shooting galleries or whatever it is. It also seems like it's a kind of absolution. Like the first reaction to it is to say, let me conjure up all the ways in which I am not culpable in this state of affairs. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there is, um, and and the challenge. Well, there are many challenges. One of the key challenges is not just about guns. You know, it's about inequality and segregation and poverty and things that the rest of the world has. Uh, mental health, although, if you have socialized medicine, then prisons aren't the primary provider of mental health care, which is true here. And then onto that huge pile of tinder you throw this easily available lethal, um, this lethal weapon. And so if you don't want to deal with any of those things, then you, then you pass it off to the individual, you know, and you, you kind of liberalize it, you know, say, well, it's, you know, it's about him or her. And I mean, my experience of 
living here for 12 years is that Americans aren't worse parents, their kids aren't worse kids. Like, that's not the problem. And, um, uh, and the thing about children which makes that position challenging is that society does understand that it has a collective responsibility for kids in a way that it doesn't for adults. You know, there are laws about kids going to school and, you know, um, uh, uh, different kinds of uh, legal status and so on. And so collectively, it's unacceptable to place the entire burden um, on, on the child. But effectively, I mean, what you say is absolutely right, that they would rather talk about anything else, anything else. And one of the challenging things in the book was realizing that in the absence of any meaningful conversation about guns or inequality or racism, that was kind of true for African Americans too. That, um, and I found that, so there were these scripts, and it didn't really matter whether they were true or not. So you say, what do you think this is about? Babies having babies, um, parents don't love their kids like they used to. And then you look at, and in my day this didn't happen. There was a lot of the ancient art of pugilism, you know, in my day, you just beat crap out of somebody. That was, you know, that was what real fighting was about. And then you look at the which, facts. Which is also, which is also troubling. Like, uh, when I argue with, I'm 47, and I argue with my peers, um, and, I mean, they get incensed when I say, no, the people who are young now are less violent and they're having less sex than we were mm. when we were their age. Um, but that's not the narrative. No, no. That, that we have attached to this. Well, exactly, that kind of, th and, and uh, yeah, teenage pregnancy is down. Right. Um, actually, you were more likely to get shot dead when we were growing up, I'm the same age. Well, I mean, I was in Britain, so you were more likely to. Um, thank you, thank you. <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> um, and, um, um, but these scripts are, are powerful, and th there was one bit where I realized um, in the research that African-American fathers were more likely to bathe, read to, and um, uh, bathe, read to, and homework. Yeah, and, and, and um, I think of feed maybe in this, because it was under five. Um, their children, even though they're less likely to be married or um, live with the kids. And I was surprised by that. And I thought, well, I'm a black father. I do all those things. And yet somehow I've internalized those scripts to such a degree that I think, really? This, you know, I'm double checking this thing and cross-referencing it and thinking, you know, how could that be? So um, these are kind of very dominant uh, ways of thinking that can easily be internalized, particularly in the absence of any other conversation. And, and so I think there's um, a lot that could be said about the book that, um, I think is uh, virtuous, but one of the things I thought was really well done um, was the contextualization of each life. Um, and so you covered a lot of different things. Like there is a lot of just um, really good journalism in terms of finding out you know, where this was, where the family was from, what the population of the town was, what was going on there, and so on. And I wondered, um, like how that process worked in terms of doing it, because it seems exhaustive. And I was like, you have this, and it was an 18 month mm. project. It seems like a lot of research that went into something in a really fairly short period of time for that to get done. Y yeah, I mean, it, it <laughs> I, I, um, I tried to make each, Place where they kill, where they were killed, a character. The day was a kind of was a dominant character, but in in the book, but also the places kind of told it their own story. Sometimes it, and it wove in with the children's story, and, and sometimes it didn't. But that, um, uh, yeah, there was there was an awful lot of kind of following. Um, it kind of following pieces of thread, like, right, I'm going to read a book about Dallas. Um, and it didn't always bear fruit, you know. I read a couple books in Indianapolis. I'm none the wiser, really. Um, uh, but a couple of times, you know, it, it 
um, it really did. And I also was at pains not to force it. So we had a kind of bit of a challenge with how we were going to put the Second Amendment in the book because it doesn't come up. People don't mention it. And so, um, uh, you know, at one stage I said, can you write a book about gun deaths and not mention the Second Amendment? Like, which is an interesting... Uh, but, you know, if it doesn't come up, then, you know, can you force it, you know? And so, no, it was... It was quite exhaustive and kind of fairly uh, uh, painstaking. I think what drove me and it was that I was kind of became deeply, deeply invested in each kid. And I felt like, I remember there was some kind of game show where a fan and a star would have a competition about who knew more about the star's life, the fan or the star. Because, you know, the fan had been kind of studying. And in that sense, I was kind of, I studied each kid's lives. So when I met their parents the second time, I'd be like, hang on, was, was that 2007 or was that 2008? Because didn't he kind of, so I kind of had timelines and, um, and then a whole kind of, um, a kind of exhaustive book list. So I was, and that kept me going. And the, the other thing that kept me going, which is, you don't see in the book, but is the kind of jig I would dance every time I found a kid. Mm -hmm. That kind of, um, like I said, these kids were not easy to find. And um, so Edwin, right at the end, kind of, you know, that came in real late. Um, a friend of a friend of someone I met at a rally in Indianapolis. I mean, it really kind of, you know, uh, coming together with kind of pieces of thread. Some of them walking down streets, putting notes in people's letterboxes. And each one, without wanting to sound too pious, just felt like, here's a story I'm going to excavate from the kind of, you know, that's been buried with the child. Sometimes 600 words, sometimes 90 words. And so that was the other thing that really kind of kept me going and made sometimes quite fallow periods where all I was doing was research, kind of um, uh, worthwhile. How did you pick that date, November 23rd, uh, 2013? It was actually the first one I could do. Uh, I might have done the 30th, um, but that I was coming off, 2013 was the anniversary of the I Have a Dream speech, and I'd written a book about that, so I'd done some touring and gone to England, so then I had to come back and was deeply in family debt, so I had a whole lot of child rearing to do. And um, so this was the kind of first period I could really seriously look at. And the one criteria was that there had to be at least seven children got shot dead. I kind of knew it had to be a weekend. It would have been easier if I'd done it in the summer. I mean, I couldn't because the um, anniversaries are going on because more children die in the summer. But it's a fairly reliable statistic and therefore you wouldn't have to wait that long for it to happen. So I kind of had this span of a week and I was tracking each day and the deaths don't all come through at once. That's the other thing is that they kind of, you know, it takes a while sometimes to come out. So this is weird, um, about a month away mm. from the third anniversary for many of these families. Are you in touch with any of the people? Do you know how they have processed and, and where they are with the grieving process for these young people three years on? Yeah, um, I'm in touch with a few. Um, so Edwin's mom, when I spoke to her, she was heavily pregnant. She had a boy and she called it Edwin, mm -hmm. which suggests to me that the grieving process is still going on in quite an intense way. I mean, she had said, you know, at the funeral, she had wanted to just throw herself in the box with him. It was only the fact that she had two other children stopped her. She, um, she was an undocumented migrant. 
who couldn't afford to bury him actually there had to be a kind of whip round in Houston to kind of make it possible um, uh, and I've, so I've been in touch with his sister because um, Marilyn doesn't speak English and I don't speak Spanish and they were Th there's a process of kind of uh, this could work in a bad way but it hasn't so far of validation that um, so his sister put just the title page each child has a chapter and their pay their, their name is on the is the title of the chapter and she just posted that as his, on his Facebook page, like Edwin's in a book, you know he barely made the paper, and now he's in a book. And then one of her friends said, "Well, what about Pico? You know, Pico?" And she said, "Yeah, I think this guy was only doing one day, but you get a sense that like this is going on, or you know, kind of this is one of her friends saying, "I, you know, I knew one kid who died." when I was growing up, they got run over. These kids are like, it's a banal part of their adolescence, just knowing of kids who died. So there's her, Nicole, Jaden's mum, who's still struggling with uh, uh, PTSD. We, we, we talk about, he would give a little bit of context about, Jaden is the first person we mm. encounter in the book. You tell a little bit about how he passed away, he's nine years old. So Jaden, uh, Jaden is actually shot the day before, but he dies within the 24 hour period. It's Friday morning, same 50th anniversary of Kennedy's assassination. So America's talking about its lost innocence, which is very careless with. Um, and um, Jaden is, there's a knock at the door, and they think it's two girls down the road who sometimes come up, borrow sugar, ask for a ride to school. Grove City, Ohio is this kind of suburb that won best hometown in Ohio. It's kind of, it's uh, kind of leave it to beaverish kind of, you know, place. So Jaden, who, so long as he is ready for school, he can do what he likes. He liked Duck Dynasty, he liked watching cars. His mom's like, get your shoes on, get your socks on, you can do anything. So he's playing Xbox, there's a ring at the door. Jaden jumps up to answer the door because everybody else is like busy. And he kind of crouches behind the door as though to say, boo. And, but then nobody comes in. So he slowly peeks his head around the door and bang. Um, and Nicole, his mom's ex-partner, and the father of Jaden's eldest brother shoots him in the head, square in the head. And then races off. Danny Thornton, his name is, and then he races off, shoots an ex-girlfriend in the uh, in the stomach, although she survives, and then is killed in a shootout with the cops in a Walmart car park. And uh, it transpired that he'd said to his son, uh, him, his and Nicole's son, who was kind of 18, 19, I'm not going to be a 47-year-old man living in my car with no job. Uh, and no home, I would rather die of suicide by cop, and I have no problem making you or your mother, uh, uh, you an orphan or killing your mother. And um, so, you know, that's, um, and Nicole, as one can imagine, is nearly three years on, and she, she, she has a very considerate boss, but there are days when she can't get out of bed still. She said to me that she sees her life, it's as though she was in a movie theater and then she came out into the kind of blinding light and she's struggling to try and adjust to this new reality. And so her life before Jaden was shot was like this film. And it wasn't a wonderful film. She was a single mom, three kids. She said I was harassed a lot of the time, you know, just tired, too tired to play with them just kind of getting a pizza and, you know, and stuff. I was raised by a single mother with two other brothers, and I can completely relate to what she's saying, you know, house is a mess, you know, just, just trying to get on from day to day. But still a, a complete film. 
and then Jaden dies, and now she's kind of struggling to kind of work out how to how to live her life. And people kind of think, move on, you know, move on already, or at least the world that and the world does keep moving. And um, so she's having a very she's having a very hard time. Uh, and then Tyler Dunn's family. Tyler is the one white boy who dies. It's at a sleepover. Um, the dad goes trucking, leaves the kids at home because they're 11 and 12, and they want to play Call of Duty. They don't want to go. Tru- they were going to go trucking with them. They decided they don't want to. This is in rural Michigan, on a dirt road, off a dirt road. And he leaves several loaded guns in the house, and the kids. Uh, Tyler's friend is showing him the gun, goes to get a milkshake, comes back. The friend's passing him. Tyler's giving the gun back to his friend, and it goes off and shoots Tyler in the head. Uh, And his family have been in touch and are grateful, I think, for um, their family of few words, but um, they were kind of grateful for... um, the space and the time that was given to them and uh, and to Tyler. There's um, one other thing I wanted to ask you about, which is uh, <clears throat> something I've reflected on myself, which is that uh, I've written about um, Trayvon Martin. Uh, I've gone to Ferguson. I uh, went to Charleston. I wrote about Eric Garner. Um, I went to Baltimore. Uh, I think I wrote about Jordan Davis. I know I wrote about Mich- Renisha McBride. Um, and I think there's a kind of uh, dynamic that happens when you write about um, death in that kind of way, uh, redundantly. Uh, and one is just the kind of search for what can be said about something that Mm. has reiterated itself in similar ways Mm. um, consistently. But also just the kind of emotional toll that that takes. And so I wonder kind of what you did as self-care, I suppose, in the context of writing about these unrelentingly um, horrible circumstances and knowing that you're getting one 365th of what could be expected to happen in that year alone. Yeah, and I think there are a few things going on. First of all, I think being foreign helps. And uh, at this point, I've got one foot in and one foot out of America because I'm, I have kids and my, my wife is American, my kids are American. Until a couple of years earlier, I'd fully expected I was going to be living here. But by the time I'm writing this book, I've decided not to. Uh, we've decided not to. And so uh, there is a touch of anthropology in terms of, like, I will be leaving this soon. And while I didn't leave because of gun violence, I left because of banal series of personal kind of, you know, just family reasons. Definitely doing this book made me not think, um, ooh, I wonder if I'll stay. You know, I d- it, it concentrated my mind. Um, the question that you asked about the, the amount of research went into it meant that I was keeping myself busy an awful lot. But then there would be these moments where it would just rush at you, and then you would just have to kind of step away. So the nine one one calls, these moments that there's there's particularly there's one nine one one call where Samuel is lying on the ground and his mother is nestling him, and the dispatcher says, "Is he? Can he speak?" And I hear Samuel groan. I think, shit, he was alive. He was alive. I've kind of got in my mind that these children are dead, and then I'm bringing him to life. And the notion that he's right in that moment, in real time, he's alive. And then I just had to kind of stop the tape and just kind of just kind of walk away from it 
a bit, which I think is how people often read the book. They like will read it for a certain amount and then say, "Okay, you know." That's how I read it. Right. Yeah. That um, uh, and then and then uh, come back to it, and it's. I hope not because it's unrelenting, but just because it's it's quite painful and a little bit like looking at the sun is one of those things that I think yeah it might be painful um you know people don't kind of want to stare straight straight at the sun but look this is kind of what does it mean with this if you decide to look away for a long time if you decide that well I can't handle this well you know what there's going to be another seven kids tomorrow and a day after that and what what's it going to take for this white noise to kind of break through um, you have uh, index cards. Uh, they, you know, you should have index cards. Um, if you have questions, um, you can. We can. Uh, are you gonna go around and collect them? And so we can open this up for um, discussion now. Uh, regarding your comment that mothers allegedly quote unquote don't care or or quote properly watch their kids, is your sense that outspoken grieving mothers, um, as at the uh, Democratic National Convention, can penetrate this? Not effectively, actually. No, I mean not not by itself. I mean, first of all, I fear there is a place in the American polity for grieving black mothers. I, I mean, if we think of um, Emma Till's mother or um, any any number of I've I've this doesn't denigrate any individual mother's pain. It's just that America has found a way to absorb that sight into its psyche. Yes, this is what black women do. They 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 grieve for their dead children. W one of the things I found. Um, telling in uh, Indianapolis, which is where uh, Kenneth um, Mills Tucker dies, and I go to the NRA convention, which is held there four or five months later, and there's a, you know, counter, counter rallies. And I'm thinking, well, maybe his family will be at this counter rally. Maybe, you know, maybe I'll find somebody there. And there's this press conference and I asked someone, I think Indianapolis is like a quarter black and uh, African Americans are massively overrepresented the number of people who are killed. I'm hoping that I will find someone among the activists, but I'm actually, there was no one from Indianapolis among the activists and I'm directed to this white lady who lives in a kind of wealthy suburb near Indianapolis who talks about gun control in terms of stopping the kind of unwashed hordes from the inner city kind of invading the suburbs. So the only black people in the room are the grieving mothers who kind of become a fa the face of a movement that they're actually not a part of in a kind of, um, in any kind of, you know, urgent organic sense. And that I think that's one of the problems for the gun control movement is that the places where this is most urgent is the places where they are least likely to be present. There are grassroots organizations doing good things, but the, the kind of um, every town kind of folks, that you don't see them in these, um, in these places. And one of the reasons for that, I think, is that they do dwell on the notion of innocence and babes, of a certain worthy victim, um, that shouldn't have been shot, which always raises the issue of, well, okay, so who should be shot? And that a lot of these kids in this book have messy lives. They have, they may have been in trouble with the law a bit. They may have been suspended from school. They, you know, th there's a range of things that you might, they may have been out at four o'clock in the morning, you know. They, there's a range of things that you might not be able to say about them a student or never been in trouble with the law or you know deacon of the church and then a range of things that you can say about them gang related um 
a drug convict, you know, conviction or whatever, that count them out of empathy. And that is a problem um, that I think as a society and as a gun control movement they have to address, like, which is actually when you start from the basis of worthy victims, then you're suggesting that there are other people who are unworthy of life. You know, that, that kind of brings me to another um, kind of related phenomenon, which is uh, I've had this conversation about the visibility of the grieving mothers. Um, I've had this conversation with a few people, and I initially I have to say I was surprised by it, <coughs> which is that uh, much of the dialogue now, or um, to the extent that we have one, much of the dialogue around these issues is driven around the fact that there's video. Mm. Um, and that uh, gut-wrenching uh, video you saw from uh, Philando Castile, his, his uh, girlfriend, Diamond Reynolds, who's in the car with him, um, and she's recording uh, as he's dying and trying to uh, explain to the world you know, what's happening. And there are these kind of video testimonies that affirm things that many uh, African Americans had been saying were happening for a long time. And of course, this tends to be around violence as it relates to the state, not you know, kind of citizen versus citizen violence. But what's interesting is that I've heard a number of African Americans now saying that they are really opposed to those images um, because they feel like they're kind of secondary trauma and that people are viewing it as a kind of empathy porn um, where they're like, oh, this is what happens. Let me show you how good a person I am by being outraged by this. But the kind of fundamental fact of it is that we're still kind of not fully humanizing these people in the midst of this spectacle. Yeah, and I guess I think that the, the problem comes with the second bit. The problem is not the video. The problem is what's changing. I mean, if we were seeing these videos and then we were seeing some move towards some fundamental change, then the videos would feel like they had a purpose. It's the fact that we are seeing these videos and all they can make us is sad. I mean, that when it comes to programs, suggestions, agendas, I think after kind of police cameras, I mean, what, you know, what, what is there in terms of kind of people, t you know, talking about what really fundamentally has to change, which is a kind of, you know, which is so big, these areas being policed like they're occupied territories, you know, which was James Baldwin's term back in the 60s, I think, that um, uh, a notion that the people who live there aren't really people, that these issues of poverty and inequality and segregation can be policed out of existence as opposed to kind of, you know, legislated in, in, in some way to kind of uh, make people's lives more tolerable. And it, so it's, it becomes a bit like blaming parents because, you know, I have this thing in the book where I'm like, look, I think personal responsibility is really important, you know, and I wouldn't want to live in a world where people just said, well, that's my culture, you know, that's, I have no personal responsibility. Um, that's how you get an election race like we got now. But that there is also collective responsibility. We live in a society and we have a responsibility to each other and if we didn't, there'd be no stop signs and everyone would be, you know, looting and it would be crazy. So we have a responsibility to each other um, uh, too. But if we're not going to talk about inequality and racism and poverty and segregation and all of those things, then all you're left with is the videos. And then that does become hard. Um, there's another question. Does anyone else have questions? You can, um, we can give those too. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, how do we combat the knee-jerk reaction of many Americans uh, for more guns, to pursue more guns, not less, after a mass shooting? Yeah, and um, I do get that. I do get why there's a, um, there's a, uh, in Indianapolis, I d described the 911 call and the shootings 
pierce the window of a, uh, a couple with a small baby. And the, the, the guy is saying, get me out of here. He's saying to the dispatcher, get me out, get me out. I just want, just, I want to be in a hotel. I don't want to be in here anymore. And then you go to the NRA convention and their, their um, slogan is stand and fight. And so on the one hand, you have this man infantilized, wanting to be helped by the state to be made safe. And then you have the NRA saying, get yourself a gun and, you know, defend yourself. And actually, um, you know, when you go to these NRA conventions and you ask them, so I don't get it, explain it to me, how does this work? To a person, what they do is evoke this situation. They say, are you married? That's the first question they ask. Are you married? Yes. Do you have children? Yes. And then they're off to the races. Imagine somebody broke into your house, they threatened your wife with a gun, they were going to rape her, they were going to kill her. What are you going to do? You're going to wait and you're going to call the police? You're going to, like, you know, try and beat them up? What, you know? And it's an appeal to masculinity, to vigilantism, to small government, to um, homestead, to this range of things that actually kind of bores quite deeply into the American psyche, whether you believe in guns or not. And the flip side of that, for the gun control po people, becomes background checks, um, things that are small incremental things as opposed to let's imagine America differently. And when you are up against those primal things, the facts kind of stop mattering. So the truth is most people who are killed by guns kill themselves. And uh, after that, you're most likely to be killed by someone you know. So what they should say is, are you married? Yes. Well, watch out for your wife because she will be the one who will shoot you. <laughs> but they don't do that because th in their world, it's always the intruder. It's always the dark outsider. It's kind of... Um, and so I do think that the gun control issue can't sit alone outside a different kind of narrative for who we are as, or who Americans are as a, a people. If on the one hand, you're smoking people with drones and it's might is right and this is what we can do, it's difficult to then say we should have this compassionate, um, collective kind of understanding when it comes to kind of domestic affairs. I know that's a big thing and that in the meantime background checks would be a really good idea. It's just that in itself it's not gonna it's not gonna remold the psyche. I mean I think it's interesting about that that kind of psyche question though because uh, in effect, we've we've run a longitudinal study on everything the NRA says, yeah. um, and we've run that study in American cities, and saying, well, what happens if you have an environment where people are far more likely than the average white person to be victims of violence, and what happens if, in this uh, same environment, people have fairly free access to weapons, mm. and what, how efficient a means of self-protection does this actually yield? Mm. And what we find is catastrophe. Mm. But because of the color of the people, we kind of assume that this is a dynamic that's associated with those people, not actually saying, no, we've actually looked at what would happen if we followed your argument to the logical conclusion. We've run that experiment, and this is what happens. Um, and not coincidentally that the portion of the population that's most likely to be killed uh, African Americans, also the portion of the population that is among the highest advocates for gun control. Right. Right, not the opposite. Yeah. Saying, uh, by theory, every African American household should have an NRA sticker mm. um, on the window saying, you know, protect yourselves. Well, right. I mean, it's curious, although not completely surprising, I'm not totally naive, that if, the, if a big part of the NRA's logic is defense against a tyrannical state, then they should be arguing for the massive armament of African-American communities in defense against the police. That would be the logic. I mean, who in this country is living in tyranny right now? I mean, it's, the, the, you know, these videos show if anyone, if any community 
could make a case for defense against the state, it would be African Americans. It wouldn't be these people in the suburbs. And so, um, uh, but they're not saying that. And I do think it comes down to something as fundamental as this, which is that in their, in the logic of the right, and guns fits into a much broader schema, uh, understanding of America. So I was at a gun show on Saturday in Indiana, and among the guns there are these kind of um, um, bumper stickers, things like nuke Iran and Hollywood, or guns don't kill people, abortions kill people, and a range of kind of, uh, see I saw the other day, it was just, this was not on a gun show, this was somebody who wasn't going to the gun show, they were just going shopping, and he said, saved by Jesus, protected by Glock. So it's not just about guns. Because right? Jesus also was packing. Just <laughs> Jesus what, was. What they don't tell you. <laughs> and um, uh, I think it really does come down to this, that they don't consider the people most likely to be killed by guns as actual people. Right. That they don't, that they think that there is something fundamentally lacking in their humanity that deprives them of meaningful sympathy and certainly empathy. And one of the things that, you don't want to make big claims for a book, but one of the things that I want, I would like the book to do is to enable some empathy. So to say, look, okay, statistically, these are unlikely to be, if you're white and rich, if you're rich, actually, but if you're white and rich, particularly, these are unlikely to be your children, statistically, or children that you know. But are they actually so different from children that you know? And are the parents actually that different from parents that you know? Like, I've done all the work for you here. All I need is a little bit of imagination for you to get there and understand these, th it's not a different species actually. It's, these are very, very, this is a very, very regular American stories on a very American day. Um, I think we can slip one question in. Okay. Um, and then we have a time for you to read a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's a question, how is this a story about gender uh, about boys, but also about mothers and boys? Good question. So, on an average day, two of the seven people who would be shot dead would be female. And, um, but this isn't an average day, it's a random day, and these were the ten that I found, and they were all boys. And it is difficult the way that these conversations are gendered because they are and um, and um, they are partly because five of the seven are boys so it's skewed but it, they, it, there is also you know um, a way in which particularly black women but women in general can be ridden out of these of these stories um, and then uh, when it comes I mean, one of the one tricky thing is that three. One thing I did know is that African American fathers are more likely to be single fathers than uh, any other race, and that three of the dads in this book are raising boys by by themselves, um, and um, which is which is um, you know which is nothing but interesting. But the 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 men are allowed to be absent, and so it's generally the women who are blamed. It's the women who are understood to be bad parents. The, the men are understood to be absent, which is a different, even when it's not true, it's a different accusation from being present and negligent. And, um, uh, and they actually tend to be at the forefront of these local initiatives and these, you know, gun control campaigns on a local level tend to be run, you know, by um, uh, um, by women. So, um, 
there is uh, there's a kind of th there's a strong relationship and there's also a, s a story that's not I wouldn't say it's not told but it's not told right and so you know coming back to your question about y you know these these images of the grieving black woman on stage there was a kind of way in which black the rest of America finds it much easier to understand black women grieving than organizing, which is kind of what they are doing an awful lot of, actually. They're not just grieving. Um, can you read uh, a little from the book? Sure. I got it. So the last, um, the last boy to be shot dead is shot dead at 3.30 in the morning in uh, Goldsboro, North Carolina. Um, on, uh, it's in a 24 hour period, so it's 3.30 on Sunday, November the 24th. At 11.15 on Sunday, November the 24th, Cleveland police rushed to the 5500 block of Linton Avenue where they found 16-year-old Darnell Jones shot in the neck. Paramedics took him to the Metro Health Medical Center where he later died. There was no profile of who he was or wanted to be, no interviews with his parents. Beyond official records, there was no further evidence that he was ever on the planet. And so it goes on. Another 24 hours and the first of yet another slew of slain children whose stories will not be told and whose passing will provoke no outrage. Researching and writing this book has made me want to scream. I've wanted to scream at Edwin and Brandon that guns are not toys, at Jerry to either take the kids on his trucking run or stay home, at Stanley to quit hanging on the corner, at Justin to watch who he hangs out with and at Tishan's mother to move. I wanted to scream at journalists and police to treat these deaths as though the lives mattered. But more than it's making me want to scream at anyone in particular, it has mostly made me just want to howl at the moon. A long, doleful, piercing cry for a wealthy country that could and should do better for its youth and children, for my children, but appears to have settled, legislatively at least, on a pain threshold that is morally unacceptable. I want to bay towards the heavens because while kids like those featured in this book keep dying, the political class refuses to not only do everything in its power, but anything at all to minimize the risks for the kids who will be shot dead today or tomorrow. So it's as though each death took place in helpless, hopeless isolation, a private, discreet tragedy complete unto itself. The broader context of race and poverty was clear to many, but when I told them of other families that had lost children that day, all seemed genuinely shocked that their grief overlapped in real time with that of others. It's though they'd lost a loved one in a war without any clear purpose, end, or enemy. A war they could do nothing about. A war they long knew existed, but hoped by luck, judgment, discipline, and foresight that they might be able to protect their kids from. A war that is generally acknowledged in the abstract, but rarely specifically addressed in the concrete. A war that took their children, but offered them no allies or community in their grief. A war they knew was taking place elsewhere, but experienced alone, as though it were happening only to them. When in fact, it was happening to America every day. 